Well, it's good to see everybody here today. Happy New Year. Really, it's just one day more than last year, isn't it? <laughs> but we tend to make a big deal about it. It's good to be here, though. I'm thankful to be, especially if we're going to be alive, to be able to worship our Lord. I can't think of anything that's a greater privilege than that. Let's take our course books and on the inside turn to page three. We're going to sing all four of these courses. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me, Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. His name, his blessed name shall be called wonderful. His name, his precious name shall be called counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Throughout eternity, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, Jesus, Emmanuel, my Savior. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. I have been, I have been redeemed. Let's go one more time on that one. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. I have been, I have been redeemed. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel. God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. Amen. Robert's going to come and read for us. Good morning. Good morning. Psalm 65, the reading of the Lord's Word. Praise waited for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that Here's prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgressions thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of the, thy holy temple. By terrible things in righteousness will thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evenings to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast no provided so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it salt with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy past drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. Let us pray. 
Father, we come before you now and we praise you. Lord, we know that we come into this world as idolaters. We know also that you chose, we, you chose your people before the foundation of the world. We look to Christ, our high priest today, as always. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Often read that Psalm 65, 4 as pertaining to God's elect ones. But you notice it's in the singular. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. Then it says, We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. When he's talking about the man being chosen to enter into his presence there in the temple, that's the high priest. And that's Christ. He's the one that God has appointed whereby we shall be satisfied with his work that he has accomplished. It's amazing how many times you read these scriptures and then the Lord brings it to light even, even more so. Good reading. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, let's sing this call to worship to the tune of, O oh God, our help in ages past. I sing my Savior's wondrous death, He conquered death and hell. Tis finished, said His dying breath, And shook the gates of hell. Tis finished, our Emmanuel Christ, the dreadful work is done. And shall his sovereign throne arise, his kingdom is begun. His cross a sure foundation laid for glory and renown. When through the regions of the dead he passed to reach the crown, exalted at his Father's side sits our victorious Lord. To heaven and hell his hands divide the vengeance or reward. The saints from his propitious eye await the sovereign Son. And all the sons of darkness flee the terror of his frown. Amen. What a glorious Lord he is. Bob's coming to read for us. Romans 3. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, let every man a liar as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abundantly through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, 
There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may be guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works, nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. May we pray. My gracious Heavenly Father, where two or more are gathered in your name, you are with us, dear Lord. We pray that you would open our eyes to see the verses, to hear Ken, dear Lord, as he preaches our Lord Jesus Christ, our righteousness, for we are sinners, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. A lot of people try to confuse the scriptures when it talks about justified by faith. They turn that into a verb. They say it's justified by believing. But that's not what it says. It's justified by faith. When I was in school, a noun dealt with either a person, a place, or a thing. <laughs> the person is Christ. That's what faith represents. And the place is the cross. That's where it was all accomplished. And the thing is his sacrifice, his shed blood unto death. That's how sinners are justified by that faith which the scriptures set forth. What a beautiful portion of scripture we have to read. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 17. Hymn number 17, and we'll stand and sing this together. Come. Thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. We went to a concert over the holidays, and for the first five minutes, they were sitting there tuning their instruments, tuning, tuning, listening, and making sure it was just right. Well, this is our prayer here. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to do what? Sing thy grace. That's what we want to do now. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, 
Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. David's going to come read for us. Second Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house made not with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us from for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the spirit, the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are, are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men that we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. No old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that they might be made the righteousness of God in him. Father, we live in earthly bodies that will perish. 
But if we belong to Christ, we will have a heavenly body that is eternal. For we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ because of his sacrifice and his blood. Open our eyes to see and give us understanding. Amen. Well, here we are at the beginning of a new year, 2023. And the Lord has directed me to preach from this particular portion of Scripture. And the title is simply The Old and the New. It is amazing when you think about the fact that we're just one day removed from 2022. And yet, in our minds, all of a sudden, people begin to think, well, everything's new and fresh. Until you get up and look in the mirror in the morning, and there's that same old person <laughs> staring back at you. <laughs> we like to go in and clean out the closet. Think, well, this is a good time to get rid of some of those old clothes. But then again, you've eaten so much over the holidays, you think, well, maybe I better hang on to them because some of the new ones I'm not going to be able to fit into. We go back and forth. We keep hearing, new year, new you. That's just the way the world thinks. But if we take what Solomon wrote, and that was written years ago. He wrote several hundred years before Christ came. But that phrase that he uses in Ecclesiastes more than 29 times, under the sun, he reminds us that in reality there is nothing new under the sun. What has been will be. That's why we have times and seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. It's just the way that the Lord has ordained it. And yet that doesn't mean we're supposed to be dismal and thinking, well, nothing ever changes. Actually, everything lives and moves and has its being as God has purposed. And therefore, we rejoice that whatever comes, it is the Lord's hand that is directing in every detail. And for that, those of us that are taught of the Lord, we certainly can rejoice. So that's what I want us to do from this text here in 2 Corinthians 5. Look at those things that are old, but oh, look at those things that are new. When you contrast them and put them side by side, and you consider what God has done for his people in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have in our Bible, what, the Old Testament, and we have the New doesn't mean we discard the old, but we go back and look at the old in light of the new. The old, and the old, the, the new is concealed, and the, in the, in the new, the old is revealed. It's one book, one Bible. And that's what's so delightful about taking this word, whether it's Genesis through Malachi in the Old Testament, or whether it's Matthew through Revelation in the New Testament, there's one message there's one spirit that has inspired this word, and there's one hope that those that the Lord has purposed to save have. I'm like that scribe of the kingdom, not the scribe of the Jewish religion, but the scribe of the kingdom of whom Christ spoke there in Matthew 13, 52. You can look over there. I'll get back here to... 2 Corinthians 5 here in a second, but in Matthew chapter 13, when our Lord came, he was preparing his people for something new that was taking place. The world didn't perceive it, but he actually came to establish, that's why it's called the New Testament, the New Covenant, that would fulfill the old by his work and that those for whom he came to establish that kingdom would enjoy the newness of what he came to accomplish. Here he says in Matthew 13, 52, Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe, notice, not just every scribe, but which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven. There were many scribes that were not instructed unto the kingdom of heaven. They continued to add tradition and rules and regulations to their religion. The scribes, 
that represented the Jewish nation. But here, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven, that's a preacher of the gospel. That's one that the Lord has taught by his grace, and I trust to be one of those. But is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure, what? Things new and old. First of all, Christ would be the chief scribe there. He's the householder. And in his house, there is a treasure of things both new and old. I believe that refers to what we're seeing here in the Old and New Testament, but all pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you come back to my text here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And this is where the title to this message is derived. It says there, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, the word be is in italic. Another way of reading it is simply, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. And then it says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I know when you go back and read some commentators or hear some preachers on this, they're trying to get you all excited about the new birth. And they're saying, you know, once the Spirit does that work in your heart, everything is new and fresh and glorious. I don't know about you, but when the Lord began His work in me and opened my eyes to Christ, everything wasn't new and fresh and glorious. My eyes were open to my depravity, to my sin. I saw I lived in a lost estate. And even as the Spirit continued to work in me and open my eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ, the closer I got to the light, the more I saw my own sinfulness. As long as the light's out, you don't perceive things as being dirty or unkempt. You've all had that experience, hadn't opened a room in a while, and then you walk in and turn on the light, and you go, ooh, what made the difference? The light. And so we're going to look at that because I don't believe verse 17 is describing regeneration or being made new in the sense of becoming a child of God through the new birth. When it says here, old things are passed away, and again, any that's in Christ, Christ has made a new creature or a new creation is what that word literally means. There's a new realm in which those for whom he came and paid the debt live. And what is that realm? We live now under the headship of Christ. The old things that have passed away are the bondage of the law. We're no longer under the law, but under grace. And they're passed away because Christ has fulfilled them. He didn't come to set the law aside, but he came to fulfill them. And oh, the joy and the liberty. That's where the newness is in knowing that under the headship of Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's good news, isn't it? I'm still the same old person. <laughs> I get up and look in that mirror every morning and it's not looking any better the older we get the, the more this body on the outside deteriorates in fact you don't have time to read it but in second corinthians chapter four that's what paul is talking about that's what leads up to what we're reading here in chapter five all that he had been through you read back i'll just highlight a couple of these verses in chapter four and verse eight because context is everything isn't it we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. See, there's the old and the new. Living in this flesh, there's nothing but oppression that comes. But, I like the buts there. Where's the hope? Well, it says here in verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. He suffered 
as a man, not for a sin of his own, but the sin of his people, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. How is the life of the Lord Jesus manifested in our body? Well, he gave us life in his spirit. And we would not know him apart from that life being manifest in us. We wouldn't have the mind even to think upon him or come to him or believe on him. All these things are evidences that there's been a work done, yes, but it still doesn't put away the fact that we are dying creatures and that the time will come when this body like a tent is going to be folded up. So in that sense, there's nothing new. The clock continues to tick toward that end. But the, the great hope that we have is that it's not all there is in this life. That if Christ has paid our sin debt, we have a hope well beyond however long the Lord has purposed for us to live here. I can't even begin to wrap my mind around eternity and never having to deal with time. All we are is time creatures. We have calendars, we have watches, and we have digital atomic watches that give you precisely the time and it, it switches over automatically at least some do we still have some things you got but we're time creatures but it's not always going to be that way and so this is where paul begins here in second corinthians chapter five and i just want to highlight some of these verses here regardless of things that are new in fact, in verse, uh, going back to 2 Corinthians 4, 16, leading up to, remember chapter divisions were put in there by editors to help us find our place, but the original texts of scripture didn't have chapters, didn't have verses, didn't even have punctuation. If you were to go back and read in the Greek, it's just one continual sentence and you have to sit there and figure out what, where it starts and where it stops sometimes. And that's why in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, he says, for which cause, what? We faint not. When we deal with the realities of what it is to live in this flesh, and it is a fallen flesh. Born that way, it'll die that way. This flesh is not going to change. That's why these preachers trying to get you to work on your habits and work on sinning less and all these things, they're false preachers. This flesh will not change be changed it's going to die even as it's lived but paul says there in verse 16 of second corinthians 4 for which cause we faint not that though our outward man perish that's just the reality we have this death sentence in our bodies we get older we look older our voice sounds more and more mature Someone told me that one time, said I had a mature voice, and I thought, well, that's, that sounds like a compliment. And then I went and looked up the word mature. It means overripe, almost rotten. <laughs> I thought, well, that, that's the way it is. I go back and listen to messages I preached when I was a lot younger, and I'm thinking, who is that young man? But that's just part of this flesh that though the outward man perish, but here's the hope, yet... The inward man is renewed day by day. What's that inward man? That's our soul. That's the spirit of God in us that continues to renew us in this flesh. And then he says in verse 17, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, even if the Lord purposes we live a hundred years, it's still but for a moment. It's a blip on the radar. It says, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The weaker this flesh gets, and it will. The weaker our minds get, and it will weaken. The brighter and more glorious appears than what the scriptures talk about, our eternal hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be with him forever. And he says in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, we live in a visible world. 
and we look around and there are things that we can see but when he says while we look not at things which are seen he's talking about we don't put any confidence in anything we see I don't care what kind of structure you build it looks all bright and pristine when it's all finished doesn't it but give it 5, 10, 15 years and go back and look at it and you think wow this even if you did nothing, the whole thing is just decomposing. You're always having to maintain it. Think about that new car, how glistening it looks and the, how fresh it smells. Well, give it a few years and the next thing you know is, what's that creak? What's that noise? Got to take it in and get it repaired. That's, that's what he's talking about. We look not at things which are seen. We're not putting confidence in things that are seen. Even in our physique, we keep trying to get back to what we looked like when we were in high school. Well, you never look that way. But somehow we keep thinking we can fight this thing and beat it. And guess what? We don't put any confidence in this flesh. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. You don't invest your time and energy and money in things that are temporal because you know it's going away. But what? The things which are not seen are eternal. I've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. I've never seen the Lamb's Book of Life. I've never seen whether my name is in that Book of Life or not. You say, well then what kind of hope can you have for eternal life based on what's written right here in this Word? Because the Lord gives what? Spiritual eyes to see. That's how these things are perceived. That's what the Lord told Nicodemus Except a man be born again, he cannot, what, see the kingdom of God. How is it we see? How is it we believe? How is it right now as I'm preaching to you from this word, you find some comfort and hope, even though everything else is falling apart? That's well, because the Lord's given us eyes to see. Others don't. They come and sit and listen, and they think, well, I'm just looking for something personal for myself here. Well, you're looking for the wrong thing then. No, we need to hear of Christ. We need to see him. When it speaks of those things which are not seen that are eternal, that's those things that Christ has come and purchased for his people and earned and established that righteousness. Think about it now. That gives us a righteousness just as equal to God and his righteousness itself. I could never achieve that in my flesh even begin. But I have it in the Lord Jesus Christ. What men strive for right now in their religion, they, they, they strive for perfection. They strive to improve. They strive for living a better life. You know what? That's our starting point. Because we have it already in Christ. You can't improve on his righteousness that has been put to the account of his people by God the Father. That's why he came. Paul said that in Galatians 2.21. If righteousness came by the law. That is by our attempts to keep the law. And observe it. And to do it. He says Christ is dead in vain. You've just pretty much said. Well if man could have done it. Then Christ didn't need to come. The reason Christ came. And earned and established that righteousness. Is because none of us could. But oh, the joy. See, that's things old and new. Everything about this flesh is old. But oh, the newness of what we enjoy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, here in verse 1 of chapter 5, we see the reality of life in this world. So long as we're alive in this world, this flesh is decaying and growing more and more feeble. That's why the older you get, when you start getting out of bed in the morning, you think, man, where are all these creaks and pains coming from? I'm supposed to be rested when I get up in the morning, and we keep changing the mattress, thinking, well, maybe it's the mattress. <laughs> no, it's the body line on the mattress. You can get some little rest, but it's just not going to get any better. And that's what Paul's talking about. We know, and underscore the word no, this is not speculation. This is not true of some versus other. We know that if our earthly 
house of this tabernacle were dissolved. And that word if can be translated since. It's not as if it won't. And notice again why we don't put too much emphasis on things temporal. How does, when he describes our earthly house, he's talking about this body. And how does he describe it? A tabernacle, that's the word tent. Usually if you stay in a tent, you're just temporarily there. That's not a place to live. But here he's describing not only what it is to live in this body, but that that tent will be dissolved. We just don't know when. The Lord does. He's determined the date, the time. We all have an expiration date. We just can't see it. But the Lord has purposed it. But here's, see, so that's the old. That's what I want you to see here. That, there's nothing new to improve on this flesh or living in this body. You say, what's the new? Well, here in house, we have a building of God. And house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Don't think of a physical house. Because that's where a lot of natural minded people think up there in heaven, I'm going to have a palace like I've ever had here before. No, when he says we have a building of God, that's a person. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Though this flesh decay and dissolve, we have in Christ that dwelling place. That's what a building is. A dwelling place and a house not made with hands. Our Lord Jesus Christ was with the Father from before time and continues to be eternally. He's, that house has not been made with physical hands. Salvation and eternal life is not in anything we contribute in doing, but eternal in the heavens. Who's in the heavens? Christ. He came in the flesh. He laid down his life. He rose again and ascended on high where he ever lives. And our hope of glory is to spend eternal life with him. So there's a reality of living in this world now. But oh, the reality. And it is a reality because Paul says we know these things are so. The world will question. And they may even question you. Well, how can you be so sure? I had a man say to me one time, it sounds like you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And I told him, I'm thankful that salvation is not an egg in a basket. It's in the person of Christ who he is and what he accomplished, and therein I rest. Now in this flesh, here it is again the old, in verse 2, for in this we groan earnestly. Every time you feel the groans, not only physically, but even spiritually, you think, well, if I'm a child of God, why do I feel so down? Or why are things so dark? Or... How is it that I just, I can't seem to believe? Well, that's all part of living in this fret flesh and groaning. For in this we groan. But what does the Lord do? Why does he purpose these times and seasons? Even for his children. Look at the second part. Desiring. The more we feel the affliction of this flesh, the more we are made to feel our depravity, the more we long then to be with the Lord and in his presence. That's what he says. Desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That's why I say the house there isn't a physical building. But put the name Christ there. The more we groan earnestly in this flesh. Because Christ came in the flesh. He endured the suffering of what it is to be a man. Not for sin of his own, but it was imputed to him. He knows what it is to be in this flesh. And yet, now to be clothed upon. What clothing is that? That's the very righteousness of God that he earned and established. With our house or with Christ, which is from heaven. That's why he came. In order to be that mediator and representative for sinners such as we are. Verse 3, 
if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. There again, the if should be probably translated when or since. Since so being that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. It's not a question, well, I wonder if I'm going to be naked or clothed. If we're in Christ, we're clothed upon. In the book of Revelation, that's what describes those white robes that are given to everyone that has come through tribu tribulation. It's not some tribulation at the end of time, but it's talking about just the tribulation of living in this life, in this flesh. And yet, through it, when we're brought into God's presence, we enjoy being clothed upon, not by any works of our own, but by the very righteousness of Christ himself. That's the only way we can have any hope. Again in verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle, there it is again, in this tent, do groan. I suppose if I went around and asked each of you right now to ask me, how's the groaning? Boy, you could write a page of things that you're enduring and going through and no one else knows about, but the Lord does because he ordains all those things. But that's part of being in this flesh. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. You're not going to get out of it. Being what? Burdened. I don't think that's just physical there. I think that is speaking of spiritual burden. The weight that we feel of knowing our depravity. And like I said, the more the light shines, the more we see it. Don't think it's supposed to be getting any better. It won't. This flesh is a real enemy. In fact, Paul said it wars against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. But, again, not, that, not for that we would be unclothed. But here again, he's thinking, the more I see my own sinfulness, it's not simply that now I see my nakedness, but clothed upon. In other words, when I do enter into the very presence of my Lord and my Savior, I have that full confidence I'll not stand naked before him. Be clothed upon that what mortality might be swallowed up of life. Everything about this flesh is mortal. Even our days are already numbered. They're written in God's book. You're not going to add to it or take from it. There again, we, we think, well, if I exercise a little more and eat a little better, you might improve a little bit your quality of life, but it isn't going to add one iota of time to your life. You're going to die at that time that God has appointed. I'm going to die at the time God's appointed. We've seen that. You've seen healthy people buffed and really specimens of health, supposedly, and the next thing you know, you, you hear they're gone. They're dead. What happened? Healed over in a heart attack. Or the Lord took them out in a car wreck some other way. We don't add to the days of our life. That's why we're not to fret about the days of our life. The Lord said, take no thought about tomorrow. But boy, we, we still do. That's part of living in this flesh, don't we? we? We spend a lot of time thinking about tomorrow, what tomorrow's going to bring. And tomorrow's not ours. The only thing about tomorrow that should excite us is the fact that if today is the last day, God's purpose for me to live on this earth, I'll be entering into his glory. And so verse 5, now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is what God. There's the hope. It's not a cooperation between us and God. No. God has wrought this, who also hath given unto us, what, the earnest of the Spirit. What's an earnest? Well, that's kind of like the engagement ring, isn't it? It's a down payment of His Spirit that whereby having the Spirit now, we earnestly desire something beyond anything in this life. Thankfully, this is not going to continue this way forever. To be absent from this body is to be what? Present with the Lord. What a glorious hope. Therefore, verse 6, we are always confident. Look at these terms. We know. We're confident. We don't have any confidence in ourselves. We have confidence in the word of God. Knowing. See, if you're having trouble with doubts, underscore these words. Knowing. That whilst we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. 
That means we're not in his physical presence. But here's the purpose. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is not something that needs to be proven to be true. I don't understand a whole lot about electricity. I don't understand a whole lot about cell phones and how on a computer you can send a picture to someone and the computer literally takes the picture apart, transmits it, and puts it back together on the other side in a click of the button. I don't understand how it works. I just know it's so. And that's the same thing with by faith, not by sight. As I said, I've not seen the very Savior that I'm declaring unto you. I've not seen the Lamb's book of life. I wasn't even there when he shed his blood. And you say, well, then how can you know? By faith, not by sight. And again, if you want to replace the word faith there with Christ, by who he is and why he came and what he accomplished and where he is now. That's what gives confidence. And see again in verse 8, we're confident. I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor while we're in this flesh. We labor. To live according to the life that the Lord gives us, the strength, the energy. And every one of us is different. Don't compare yourself with one another. You are who you are. I am who I am by the grace of God. So I labor. I'm not worried about what that other person is doing over in their part of the field. I labor where the Lord has put me. That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. That doesn't mean... Here that we work to be accepted. But he's saying we labor as ones who are accepted. Already in the beloved. That's why we don't give ourselves to works. Or to what other people do to strive to be pleasing to God. And whether absent or present or absent. That we may be accepted of him. That we may continue to be accepted of him. And our acceptance is in him. Now, when it says in verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that's where some halt. They think, oh, well, we are all going to appear before him who is on that throne. That judgment seat is his throne. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And when people read that, they start getting nervous. Well, then... Does that mean uh, that I'm going to be judged or rewarded by the things I've done? Here's the beauty of appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. Is that that judgment has already taken place in the person of Christ and in his death. And so for me to receive according to what I have done, whether it be good or bad... I'm going to receive what Christ has done on my behalf. Otherwise, I have no standing. And that's the beauty. We don't fear standing before the judgment seat of Christ, knowing that he's already borne the judgment. And the scriptures say there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's not a fearful thing for those for whom Christ paid the debt. But those that should fear, as we're going to read a little later here, read a little earlier. Those that should fear are those that do not have Christ and are attempting to stand before him based upon their works. Well, you can go and read that in Revelation chapter 20. That, that book of works is open and your name's in there. <laughs> it's nothing but condemnation. That's how you'll be judged. But remember, there's the book of the Lamb. And those names that are in there, God has said, enter into my kingdom. For whom that kingdom had already been prepared by the Father through the work of Christ. But that's why he says in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. That doesn't mean we're trying to twist their arms and get them to believe. But. Knowing the terror of the Lord, knowing he's a holy and just God, 
We persuade men. How do we persuade men? Not to look to their works of their flesh or to any will of their own, but we persuade men to look to Christ alone, who is God's righteousness. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. In other words, even as I'm preaching now, I'm not just giving information. I'm declaring unto you the very confidence which the Lord has given me. I pray he keeps me in that confidence. And I say these things for your own conscience sake. That we not look to any work of the flesh or anything in ourselves, but to Christ alone. Verse 12, for we commend not ourselves again unto you. Paul saying, I'm not trying to build myself up before you as to who I am. But give you occasion to glory on our behalf that we may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. He was facing opposition, as we will do. By declaring that salvation is in Christ alone, we have a whole world out there that says, no, it's not in Christ alone. See, they don't like that word alone. They'll say it's in Christ, but, and there's where you get in trouble, but you also have to contribute your part. No, it's in Christ alone. For whether we be beside ourselves, they were saying Paul was crazy, that he was out of his mind, as some will do. I've had people say, say that to me. They said, can't you ever answer a question without the word? No. Everything has to be established by the word. Others have said, is that all there is? Is Christ, Christ, Christ? Well, that's all there is for me. And whatever men may think of me out of my mind or crazy, Paul says it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. It's a sobering matter. Especially as we deal with acquaintances and loved ones and family members that have no knowledge of Christ and are still in darkness. It's a sobering matter. But at the same time, we commend them to God. We commend ourselves to God. Knowing that if he's chosen them and Christ has paid their sin debt, then he will draw them in his time. That's not us to do. That's God's work to do. But the love of Christ constrains us. His love for us. Knowing how he has loved us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. When he talks about died for all, it's not the word all there is in every single person in the world. But it's all in the sense of all kinds of. See, we tend to pick and choose our acquaintances based on what we like or don't like. No. If Christ died for all kinds of sinners, then it's because they were all dead. They could not have done anything of themselves. They were dead in their trespasses and sin. And that he died for all, again, sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue is what that means. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So that's the fruit always of Christ's death. It's life. That's why we don't believe that he died for every single sinner in the world. That's not what the word all means. All kinds of sinners, yes. But if he had died for every single sinner, then all would be made alive. And we know that's not the case. But all for whom he died, he died for them because they were dead. And could do nothing for themselves. Wherefore, verse 16, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Paul's speaking there about those that would try to get him to change his persuasion. You can change a preference, but you can't change a pers persuasion. I know whom I have believed in, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So he says we... No, no man after the flesh. We don't look at anybody else after the flesh to determine what we believe. But he says, though we have known Christ after the flesh, he's saying that if there is one to look to uh, in a man after the flesh, it was Christ. We look to him having come in the flesh. But he says, yet now henceforth know we him no more. He's talking about 
no more in the flesh. He's, he rose, he ascended on high. <laughs> There's a man in glory that when we're taken from this world, we will see fully and completely, but we know him no more in the flesh now. He came for a time, that's it. So people that want to try to bring him back or think, boy, if we could just get Christ back on, no. He came one time for one purpose, for one sacrifice, for one obedience, for one salvation, and now having accomplished it, has ascended back on high where he now lives to intercede on behalf of his people. And that leads then into verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Think about all that that means to be in Christ. I was chosen in him. When he came, he was my representative in the flesh. When he died, I died. That was my death. He died. When he rose, I rose. When he ascended on high, all that is what it is to be in Christ. My salvation's in him. That's why it says any in Christ is a new creature, new creation. It's like a new world in which we live. Old things are passed away. It's not talking about this flesh. This flesh is what it is. But it's talking about those old things concerning the law and the requirements and all of the legal condemnation that I was under until Christ came and paid the debt. That's all passed away. And there's that word, behold, <laughs> all things are become new in Christ. What is there in Christ that we don't have? We have redemption, we have justification, we have sanctification, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have reconciliation, hope of eternal life, all of these things have become new in him in that we live in that newness of life in him and that's why he says in verse 18 and all things are of God See, it's repeated again how is all this taking place of God who hath what reconciled us who's the us keep it in the context those that are in Christ to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation in other words, when we go out and speak to others, testify to others of what Christ has done for us, it's a ministry of reconciliation. We're pointing them to the only one whereby reconciliation has been accomplished, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. To wit, that word to wit means namely, verse 19, that God was in Christ. When it says reconciling the world, it's just like that word all. It means the Gentile nations. See, he's writing here to, to people that the Corinthians were Gentiles. And there was a thinking that the Messiah would come only for the Jews. But Paul's clearly declaring, no, he was reconciling Gentile sinners unto himself. Boy, the Jews didn't like to hear that word. That was like a curse word to them but not imputing their trespasses unto them. All that time from the Old Testament until Christ came, those Gentile nations that were considered to be separate from the Jewish people, yet God was not imputing their trespasses unto them, but was now through Christ has reconciled them unto themselves, those sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. They were after Paul because even though he was a Jew, he was out preaching to the Gentiles. Boy, they couldn't stand that. But here he is declaring why he did it. Because God has his elect, those for whom Christ paid the debt. And therefore the word, notice, the word of reconciliation. There again, it's Christ. He is the word. And it's only by him that sinners are reconciled. So he says in verse 20, now, then we are ambassadors for Christ. That's what it is to go out and represent the Lord Jesus Christ and declaring his gospel. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's not pleading with sinners. That's a command. That if you would know reconciliation with God and the blessings of what's been described here, it's going to be in Christ alone. And it's going to be by God doing that work of grace in your heart. 
Why? You see verse 21 ends with a four. That's the conclusion. Here's the reason for all of this. He hath made him to be sin for us. Didn't make him a sinner for us, nor did he make him sinful for us, but to be made sin. That one word represents the sin offering. His soul was made an offering for sin. But God made him to be that sin offering for us. Again, the context is those in Christ who knew no sin. We're nothing but sin, but he knew no sin. He could not have known sin, never experienced it. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the only place any can be made the righteousness of God. That's the only way that any can hope to be clothed upon in eternity. It's going to be through this work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Isn't that a great chapter? Man, you could just, that's one of those storybooks. You go back and read it again. Get all done and go back and read it again. Well, I hope so. Certainly a lot there to give us rejoicing as we continue our pilgrimage in this life. Woke up this morning. Hey, still serving out a life sentence. And we will until the Lord opens those gates and lets us fly away like a bird. It's hymn number 118. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and for contempt on all my pride forbid it lord that i should boast save in the death of christ my god all the vain things that charm me most I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow mingle down. Did e'er such love and sorrow me or thorns compose so rich a crown were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul 